Hello. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Huayang Di. Greetings. Hello. Mauya. Welcome. Welcome. We come together to share the love of Jesus. Well, good morning. Another day the Lord has given us. Let us be thankful for this day. And as we are gathered in this place, again, we are called to invite the Spirit of God to awaken in us what God would say, but also to commit our cares, our concerns to God. And as Jesus walked in the, uh, upon the face of the earth, so too we experience his love and his grace and share our lives with each other. So let us do that at this time. Holy One, as we are here in this moment, again, we prevail upon you to send your spirit, to be in our hearts and minds, to forgive us where we may have resisted your spirit this past week, but open us again through your grace and your love to hear it even now in this moment. You know, the concerns we have for our nation, for our families, for our cities and country, may again, we offer them to you so that we might be able to hear what you'd say to us in these moments. We pray all this in and through your holy name, Amen. Please join me in singing, We Have Come at Christ's Own Bidding. We have come at Christ's own bidding to this high and holy place where we wait with hope and longing for some token of God's grace. Here we pray for new assurance that our faith is not in vain, searching like those first disciples for a sign both clear and plain. Light breaks in upon our darkness, splendor bays the flesh-joined word. Moses and Elijah marvel as the heavenly voice is heard. Eyes and hearts behold with wonder how the law and prophets meet. Christ with garments drenched in brightness stands transfigured and complete. Strengthened by by this glimpse of glory, fearful lest our faith decline, we, like Peter, find it tempting to remain and build a shrine. But true worship gives us courage to proclaim what we profess, that our daily lives may prove us people of the God we bless. So we've been journeying through the season of Epiphany, and this coming Wednesday we'll begin this time of Lent. Now as we enter into Lent, we have 40 days going up to the time of, of uh, Easter and the Resurrection. And each Sunday through that period of time, we don't count because it's uh, each of our Sundays is a mini Easter, a mini Resurrection Sunday. So we just count those 40 days. And what that says to me is that we got a journey coming on we, as we end this time of reflection of those places where particularly God broke in and is breaking into this world through the lives of saints and through your life and my life, we then enter into this period particularly of, of going deeper, going deeper within to, to ask God to awaken on us all the more what the God's Spirit is saying to us and also then so that we might reveal that to others around us. And so Jesus spent some time after his baptism we, we hear the account of his baptism going out and to the desert and experience of testing or tempting. And so today I'd like to talk a little bit about temptation because all of us experience temptations in different ways. And it doesn't mean that God isn't with us. It just means that we're going to go through times of trial. And you and I, if, if we're open to the Spirit of God, will find that that is true for us as well. So we will look at a passage from the uh, Gospel of St. Matthew 
and hear about Jesus being tempted. Again, temptation in itself is not an evil. We all get tempted. It's what we do with that temptation. Now, this is an important passage because we find it, this description is in Matthew and in Luke, and there's a brief uh, allusion to it in Mark even about Jesus' temptation. He had been baptized, and there was a public recognition, at least those that were around when Jesus was baptized, of the, the Spirit of God coming upon him. And then we find this strange experience of him going off into the desert and having these tests. So again, this is coming from Matthew chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against the stone. Then Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to, the vi to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. So there are some components in this text that, that I think stand out, at least stand out to me as I hear this. Uh, a couple of things are immediately hit me. It's, it's 40 days. What is this 40 day idea? Well, we hear of 40 days in the Bible in various places. We hear 40 days, for instance, Noah. We hear 40 days, Jesus going in the desert, obviously. And, and there's periods of this, this 40. Well, 40 is about the idea that there's a, this extended period, just the right amount of period. It isn't specifically, well, you know, you got to look at 40 days each day waking up. But it is this expression of, of having this perfect time frame. So he was out there for a long time. And what we immediately hear is that he has these three temptations. Why three? Why not six? Why not one? Well, again, the idea of three in the, in the Hebrew's mind was a, 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 a number of completion. So particularly he's pointing to that, there, that he underwent trials, and these three particularly point out uh, a sense of completion for him at this moment at least. In addition, the temptations himself express a bit about who Jesus is. Now, what I found over the years is that temptations that people experience are often tell you a lot about who they are and what they're going through. Each one of us may experience temptations in different ways, which I, that tell us about our souls and who we are. So for some people, maybe they're, they're tempted by eating. Others might be tempted by sex. Others might be tempted by drugs. Others might find that their, their temptation comes from uh, power or money or, or a sense of dominating others. And, and here we find some interesting text because you can't te uh, test or tempt a good person by particularly an evil. So you don't find Jesus being tempted, to, for instance, around sex. You don't find him going out and getting drunk. And so what are these temptations about? And I think they, they are a delineation about what his ministry is to become. Temptations for him in terms of, well, how do I express the kingdom of God or, or the, what God is telling me that is that connection that he has with the Father. How do I express that to others? And so we find in these, pay, in these texts Jesus' temptation to express what the kingdom of God should look like. So let's go back to the first one. He says, it says, the tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, command these loaves to become bread. Or excuse me, command these stones to become bread. So what is that about? So he's been hungry. We know he's been out there for some time. And he he's looks at the stones and command him to make bread. Well, I would suggest that it isn't just about bread for himself. His temptation is, in, is to, to have some sense of the, those around him that are also without food. That is a bigger temptation, a temptation to feed the entire world. Uh, maybe you felt like that at times, and you see pictures of, of folks starving. 
and you can understand if you are a person of compassion, which I trust many of you are, that you want to do something about it. And how would it be for God at this point to want to break in and defeat everybody? Well, there's a dynamic between what goes on in our world and what God does. That, and that dynamic is, is that what we call, what we, what we invite God, spirit that moves in those areas. And if, if we choose not to, if we do not choose not to, to use the resources you've been gin, given, it is our free will that allows us to do so. So we have no, more than enough resources to feed the hungry in the world. Yet if we choose not to use it in that way, then people go hungry. And God has given at us those, the free will to do that. And so what I feel that's going on here is Jesus is being tempted to break outside of the boundary, to, to feed everyone. It isn't just about him. It's about feeding everyone through this. And so he's tempted. He longs to help everyone. And it gives you a sense of what God is about. God longs to bring healing to our entire world. And yet what we find is that we don't just live by by that bread. It isn't just our sustenance by physical sustenance, but we have a deeper longing. We have a longing to be connected with God. And if we just feel our physical sustenance without the, the deeper level, then we're still missing it. And so that connection that God would have for us is expressed in this first temptation. Feed them just the physical and, and forget the, the kind of, if you will, the spiritual depth. And Jesus says no. And it was also interesting is that Jesus uses a scripture. So it tells you really the importance of, of the scripture itself, that Jesus refers back to it. And so, again, as we go through this coming months of Lent, as we have an opportunity of, of 40 days going towards Easter or the resurrection, I would invite you to spend time more in studying scripture because, like Jesus, we are called to know those and allow the Spirit of God to give us the power over temptations that come to us. And in, and in part, what we find with Jesus doing is he uses the word, this, this written word, is a way to, to reflect and respond to those temptations that comes to him. So, okay, so the first one be being, again, feeding the world. Okay, so now let's go on to the next one. The next one we hear is the devil took him to a holy city. Well, Jerusalem is probably the holy city, right? So he placed him on the pinnacle of the temple. So he's way up there. So here we have s some significant symbols going on. We have the temple where they would go and they would experience the presence of God in Jerusalem. And, and through the means of sacrifice, they would encounter the presence of God. So not only is Jesus being taken there, but where is he at? He's at way up on top of the pinnacle. Someone's going to see him up there, right? How did that guy get up there? And so we have this, this uh, showing of what? Well, what we're told is he says, well, throw yourself off of this pinnacle. Why? Well, we're told the angels will hold you up. You won't, you won't be hurt. Well, again, what would happen if you have a, this whole crowd of folks there? There is an area for men. There is an area for women. They see this guy up on top of the pinnacle. He throws himself off, and he kind of gently comes down, and he's standing there. They're going to go, oh, my gosh, it's God. There's something going on here amazing, right in God's presence. Is he, you know, who is he? Again, I believe it is an expression that use the miracles that Jesus has to convince everybody. Do something so astounding that no one, can, no one has to live by faith. And I think that there is this, this push that God wants us to be people of faith. It isn't just by showing these amazing miracles, which he does for folks out of love for, for them. And it, and it goes in with the idea that Jesus continues, says, don't tell anybody what I'm doing. He doesn't want to use these miracles as, just, as the defining marker of, his, of who is, what his ministry is about. He wants people to, to be open to the spirit and to live in the faith and when they have oh, an expression of faith, they become connected with God, and the miraculous does occur. And I trust that if you're open to God's grace and move in faith, the miraculous will occur in your life as well. So that's temptation, too. To use miracles to convince not only those that have faith, but those that perhaps don't have any faith at all by, by a flashy sheen, 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 uh, excuse me, scene. So I'm not going to be showing you flashy miracles around here any day soon because I don't believe that's what defines Jesus' ministry. I think we're called to, to follow in as disciples in the same way. So be open to faith, be open to share what we have, but that doesn't define who we are. Our definition is by being followers of Jesus, we too lean into these uh, ways of, of accompanying and gathering and being with each other. So what's the last one here? We find that he then is taken up on a uh, place on a mountain, and he's shown all the kingdoms of the world. And there's splendor. So you can imagine, 
I don't know, maybe you're up in a plane, you look down at night, you're, f- you're going over and it's a clear night and you see all those little lights surrounding the earth. I, mean, I don't know how many miles a person can see from an airplane way up there, but I know that it's amazing when you look from a satellite, you can see all those little lights. And so Jesus has a sense of all these nations. Well, today, as many of us are experienced in our own nation, there's division going on, right? There's a division of a variety of things. There's divisions between our nation and other nations. Just imagine the temptation it would be to say, guess what, if you come and bow before the demonic, I will give you power over all these. That you can, in fact, stop all the bickering, stop all the problems that are happening. That would be a huge temptation. At least I would think it would be a huge temptation. You could just say, well, guess what, America's not going to have any more problems because I'm going to just be the one that directs everything. Well, what happens to free will at that point? What happens to our willingness, our ability to then choose to follow Jesus or choose not to. And Jesus then responds, you only worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That ultimately Jesus is saying, I am not choosing to to take over everybody's free will. I'm not choosing to to, uh, move in a way against what God has set up, the, the, the dynamic between us and the world around us. I'm not choosing to impose my will on you. And said, it is a choice that each one of us has to to take ourselves. That you and I are called to choose love, to choose to follow Jesus and and his example. And in that way, it is something that we then live live into and follow. It isn't something that God imposes on us. And so I'm not going to say to you, well, you know, be a Christian. Well, I would invite you to be a Christian out of love. But for me to impose you, it on you, like through a sword or some other way like that, is not, I think, God's intention. That God's intention is that we choose it freely. And then because of that, each day we have a choice. How do we live our lives? How do we live into that? So we hear what defines Jesus in terms of his, the temptations. He doesn't do these outlandish miracles that convince both persons of faith and those that are not. He doesn't take away our free will, nor does he feed all the hungry around the globe. But what what does he put his energy into? Well, as we journey through this time towards Easter or the resurrection, he he focuses it upon the cross. And in that way, you and I are called to a similar ministry where we then focus on the cross that we bear. So I'd like to turn to the Gospel of St. Luke and read about what Jesus says about the cross. Again, this comes from Luke chapter 9. Then he said to them all, If any want to become my followers... Let them deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will save it. What does it profit them if they gain the whole world but lose or forfeit themselves? Those who are ashamed of me and my words and of the the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. So what's going on here? Well, we hear that, again, if, we, if you spend your whole life getting stuff or working hard to amass uh, kind of your own little kingdom, we're told that you're going to lose it. That once death comes, it's nothing. It, it is, it, you know, to you in terms of what it meant in this journey, it's nothing. But what we're, we're told is to move into the cross. What does that cross look like? Well, again, it's about serving those around you. And in living into that idea that as we die to ourselves, that is like a parent whose life is, is expended both to their, for their children as needs come up or perhaps even their own parents as their parents get older, we give of ourselves, we share our lives, we die to our own uh, desires or, 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 or perhaps our own needs at times so that we then serve those around us. And in that way, we face the cross. Well, as Jesus says, if you want to follow him, that is your example. Now, it isn't something that we're forced to do. It's something that we choose to do. It's a choice that God gives us. That if we want to know and experience the kingdom and the spirit of God's movement, that we choose that instead of uh, imposing it upon those around us. So it isn't about rules and regulations. It's about letting the spirit guide you. Now, you and I are going to experience temptations. And there's an acronym that I find helpful. It's called HALT. Hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. And in those are ones that each one of us, as we live our lives, are called to be aware of. If I'm hungry, just like Jesus was hungry, I may be tempted to do something. Perhaps I might be tempted to overeat or, or, or do things that, in a way, uh, don't allow me to follow the Spirit. Maybe I'm so hungry that I, that I don't see the needs of those around me. 
And so there's opportunity to uh, express or to do those things that care. Now, I was told uh, by a friend of my, my uh, this last week about an ex- experience that he had when he was a young uh, medical prof- uh, doctor. He was in, a, in an area where he had been in the, in the South caring for individuals. And this man came in, and the nurse said that he couldn't, she could not get his pulse. And he's like, well, what do you mean you can't get his pulse? Well, what, what went on is that is he then took this man's pulse. This, this man's pulse was so f- fast that she had a hard time even knowing it was there. Well, he was on the verge of having a stroke. And so my friend said to him, well, with, with intimidation and scared, he's like, well, let me, let me get you the medication you need, and, and you need to go see a specialist. Well, this man said, uh, thank you, and, 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 and he's, he was going to go that way. He said, but you got to know something, Doc. I don't have enough money to buy the meds. So my friend at that point, he himself was an intern, didn't have a lot of money, said, well, here, let me give you the money to buy the meds. And so the man was thankful for that. But as he's walking out, Again, he stops, turns around, looks at him, says, Doc, I've got to be honest with you. My kids are hungry. I'm not going to buy the medication. I'm going to go feed them instead. Well, my friend stopped again and said, I'll tell you what, you go buy food for your kids, and I'll, I'll make up with the pharmacist. So you go, go buy your meds, and I'll make sure that he's paid. To me, that is an incredible expression of God's love for others, but also the cross, both for this, this man who didn't have enough money for his children and for my friend who was willing to give out of what little he had to make sure that this man received the medical care. So hungry, does it control you? Or are you going to allow the ability of God's Spirit to give you the control over it? Or maybe angry. So again, hungry, angry, lonely or tired. Maybe there's places where you get angry or a combination of hungry or tired and angry. I know sometimes I see that on the road, this road rage, that people get angry, and they've been letting that kind of foam out inside and, and, and get more and more strength in them. And so, again, as we journey through this life, you and I are called to, to be aware of what are those poles inside and not let them control us, but in fact, with the Spirit of God, have control over them. Or there's rhythms through your week. You might find that you are particularly tired. Maybe you're putting in a lot of hours. So Friday comes or Saturday comes and you're really tired out and it is at that moment in your life you got to go, you know, this is a time every week that I find that I'm really tired and you're more susceptible to fall into temptation, to do things that pull you away from the Spirit of God. Maybe stay up late or do other types of things like that and, and instead you might uh, t- choose behaviors that help you to overcome that. Take a nap or recognize that, you know, this is a time during the week that I just need to chill. I'm just going to sit and be a bit more peaceful. Or, f- or find some friends to encourage me. So again, you and I are called to have those rhythms, to be aware of them, and to not let them dominate our lives, but like Jesus, have power over them. Now Jesus uses the, the again, the, the, the scriptures themselves to overcome them. And so it is important that you and I immerse ourselves in the scriptures to, to use them, to overcome them, to be awakened to the reality that there are times that we will feel tested or tempted And it isn't that God wants us to fall into them, but to have power over them. So let's spend a little time recapping what's going on today. As we go towards Lent, uh, through this experience that we're called to be drawn closer to God, we remember Jesus' own temptations where he was tried. And so we're we're called to remember that we too will be tried in this life. Jesus doesn't then do the temptations, don't draw him into doing things that that, uh, involve huge miracles or or taking control of us in terms of giving us, uh, taking our free will away. He doesn't feed all the hungry of the world because he invites us to participate in those ways. And so you and I then, as we journey along as well, we'll face temptations. But what defines Jesus' ministry is the cross that you and I are called also to know and experience and to live into. Now I'd like to share with you this Lenten season, a book that I ran across. It's called Savior, What the Bible Says About the Cross. If you'd like to get a copy of that, let me know. We'll see if we can't get you a copy of this uh, book. It helps go into the, what the cross is about and how the cross works for each one of us. Uh, the salvation or healing of our lives and drawing us into a relationship with God and living more fully with God's grace and peace. With that said, again, 
And it's been uh, a joy to be able to give you the opportunity to both think about ways that you'll struggle, but also that God gives you the power to overcome them and live a life more fully with the Spirit of God. Please join me in singing, You Are My Hiding Place. You are my hiding place. You always fill my heart with songs of deliverance. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. Let the weak say I am strong in the strength of the Lord. You are my hiding place. You always fill my heart with songs of deliverance. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. Let the weak say I am strong in the strength of the Lord. You are my hiding place. You always fill my heart with songs of deliverance. Whenever I am afraid, I will trust in you. I will trust in you. Let the weak say, I am strong in the strength of the Lord. As we come together in prayer, it is an opportunity to again invite the, the kingdom, God's power into this world. As a reminder of what God's longing is, I'd like to share with you one of the, my favorite passages from the epistle of St. John. And John is the, the disciple that was close to uh, Jesus' heart. We're told that uh, he had a, some pretty amazing miracles that followed him, including being boiled in oil. And he, he can't kill him that way, so he lives. And eventually he's, he is uh, sent to the island of Patmos. And he, there's um, some monuments on that island to his being there in that cave. And he receives the revelation in, in that moment as well. But as one who walked closely with Jesus, we hear these words from him. He says, Beloved, so beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. So he's particularly speaking of the Father, that only the Son has seen him. But you and I are called to know that as we love, that is this idea of agape, that as we love deeply, we come to know God. And it is with that, then let us go to prayer as we offer loved ones in our lives in this world into God's presence and to invite the Spirit of God to bring healing and hope to them. Holy One, as we come to you in this moment, again, we invite your Spirit to come. May your love so hold those who, who you bring to our hearts and minds that, that they are changed, that they are brought to wholeness, they are given hope, and that we too are led by your Spirit to think of them and to hold them in your presence. So with that said, Holy One, May your ways come for those who are weighed down by burdens of illness or a sense of brokenness in their lives with their families and those around them. Or perhaps they're looking to the future and they're wondering where the f financial resources will come from or needing of housing. Holy One, again, may your love break open the doors. May they be able to see and experience your grace even now. And since you are the one who can provide in many ways, may your provisions open up for them. If there are things that they've done or said that have kept your spirit from intervening into their life, may your forgiveness also cover them. As your love is expressed on the cross, may as you bore the cross for them and for us, may in this moment they experience that sense of forgiveness. And as we lean into then your spirit's calling, again, we pray for the creation which with upon which we walk, that it too may be healed. May the animals, the birds, the bees, the flowers and the trees all again experience your wholeness. 
And in this way, not only humanity, but all the world experiences the kingdom breaking in. And finally, Holy One, as we think of our nation and, and the nations around us, there's so much struggle and, and, and animosity that seems to be voiced. Again, we prevail upon you to bring truth to undergird our love for each other. You help us to see and experience even now your grace intervening and breaking in. Where there's been anger and animosity, may you open the hearts and minds to your sense of peace. May we then find a way forward as your spirit calls and leads us. We offer all this as well as those unspoken requests even now to you, Holy One, for you are more than capable of, of bringing wholeness and wonder into our world. We pray in your name. Amen. As we conclude our time together, it again, it is a joy to, to send you on your way with a benediction. Again, the word benediction is to go or to give a good word. More than that, it is to invite the Spirit of God to be with you in this time. For those of you that are able, this coming Wednesday, I'm going to be offering ashes uh, for, for the Ash Wednesday service at 2 o'clock here at the church, and I invite you to come and be part of that. And if you're not able uh, to be here, again, there are probably places in your community that are also uh, offering ashes for, for our beginning of the journey towards Easter or Resurrection Sunday. With that said, Holy One, we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that as we go our different directions, help us to know that we do not go away from you. May your life, may your spirit hold us, and may we know the reality that your love carries us into the challenges, the temptations, the trials, but also gives us the strength to overcome them. And with that, then, may your kingdom break forth all the more. We pray in your name. Amen.